It was 10 years ago this week that the District Attorney of Philadelphia uh, announced the results of a Philadelphia grand jury report, uh, a press conference that shocked the nation as he talked about the Kermit Gosnell House of Horrors abortion clinic scandal that rocked the nation, as I said, and uh, made national news at least for a time. And uh, we are excited to be talking about this issue and about the fallout uh, from that grand jury report, what happened after the fact, what the grand jury exposed, what was happening in Philadelphia and in the abortion industry general, generally, and then uh, um, the fallout uh, related to legislation that passed in Pennsylvania and elsewhere to try to rein in the horrors that happened not only at the Gosnell abortion mill in West Philadelphia, but in other places in Delaware and across this nation. We have some special guests to join us. Uh, first, uh, our communications director, the director of communications at Pennsylvania Family Institute, Dan Bartkoyak, joins us uh, as well. And then our special guest, uh, best-selling author and uh, a movie producer, uh, Anne McElhenney. Uh, we're grateful to have you joining us uh, to talk about this. You, uh, you're the author uh, with uh, Philem McAleer of the Gosnell book, the best-selling book, and then the movie uh, by the same name, Gosnell, featuring uh, uh, actor Dean Cain. And uh, welcome, great to have you with us. Thank you, it's great to be here. Well, I wanted to, uh, to start with you, and uh, you know, I've read the book, saw the movie, uh, was moved, uh, having known the, 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 from the grand jury report going forward, known just what a shocking story it was and what a terrible thing with, with uh, babies uh, and women uh, being killed at the hands of this, uh, this abortionist, this uh, so-called doctor. You uh, came across this, or I, I first heard from you at the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference, the year that the trial was taking place. You came to speak about another movie that you uh, and your partner had, had produced called Frack Nation. And uh, that was what you came there to speak about. But as you took to the podium, you quickly talked about something else. So tell us about that and, uh, and how you became aware of this Gosnell story. Well, it's, ex it's exactly right, actually. The funny, the reason, you know, Pennsylvania features a lot in our recent work. Uh, we had made a documentary called Frack Nation about the fracking controversy. Um, and obviously a lot of that was filmed in Pennsylvania. And when that came out, um, my husband, Phelan, was traveling around the country showing the film and was actually in Pennsylvania, had a couple of days off. And uh, rather than come all the way back to Los Angeles, he went to, Pen he went to Philadelphia and heard about this trial that was going on and, and went into the courtroom. And my husband was a journalist for many, many years with, with you know, the Sunday Times, the Financial Times. And as you guys know, they, they reserved a, a big courtroom for this case um, when, when they were hearing for they, they actually, and the reason they chose a large courtroom was because they expected a massive media interest in the story. Um, and you know, two things struck him at that time and struck us was that the jury were sitting and opposite the jury, as many of you probably know this, they projected the images of um, the children's bodies that they had found in the clinic on the day of the raid, the 47. Many of them had been brought, they, they were brought to the ME's office, they were photographed. So you had witnesses in the stand talking about the deaths of these children, children that had been born alive and then murdered by Kermit Gosnell or by some of the staff who he had trained you had, you had that witness testimony, you had these extraordinary photographs. And the most extraordinary thing of all was that the courtroom was actually empty. And that the world's media, specifically the American media had decided not to report on this story, which as a journalist, this is, you know, this couldn't be, this couldn't be more newsworthy. This is, this is what journalists, I know it sounds horrible, but this is what journalists, you know, this is what we look for. We look for a story like this. It has all those elements. Yeah, you know, I, it, you I know. just put a picture of the screen from, uh, a, a picture on the screen of that empty courtroom. Uh, this was a reporter, J.D. Mullane took this picture and right. put it in his newspaper. That was during the trial, these seats reserved for the media and there they were sitting empty. And, and by the way, a lovely detail there. Do you see the man there at the back? Yes. 
That's Jim Wood. That's Detective Jim Wood. <laughs> he had, he identified himself to me from that photograph, and he was quite you know amused that it was that they caught him in that one. It was during a during during the day, but uh, but that was that was Jim Wood, and it's very shocking that because as you say, they wrote on the they said reserved for journalists, reserved for journalists, and then journalists decided not to turn up for this extraordinary case. Um, and and what happened then was Phelan came back to Los Angeles and said, this is what we have to do to he, to me and to our uh, our other partner, Magdalena Segeda. And, you know, we were, and we, we heard the story and we said, no, we want nothing to do with abortion. We had done a lot of work on environmentalists. We had, you know, we, we had no, it, this is not something we were interested in. We weren't, and we, you know, it's too controversial. We were kind of a little bit, a bit squishy on the abortion issue ourselves. We were like, you know, you know, pro-choice, whatever. And then Phelan said, look, what, 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 let me do this. Let me, let me buy the transcript for this last week. Let me, let me just buy that transcript and read that transcript. And he did, and we read that transcript and we decided there was nothing else that we wanted to do. Um, and we all got an education. Everyone who did the work on this, on this movie and um, in writing the book got an education on abortion that, um, that we hadn't asked for and that we definitely needed. So uh, the transcript was the transcript from the trial? Yes, yes, which is, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, it's incredible that the, what, what people learned here of what happened here in, and I think, you know, and the, the grand jury is a wonderful document, an incredible document, but you know, and one of the, I think the tone of that grand jury document is, is, is anger and disbelief that all of this went on in plain sight. That's the worst bit in a way. It went on in plain sight for 17 years, no one inspected the clinic. No one from the Pennsylvania Department of, of Health in Harrisburg, you know, may God forgive them for what they did, that they sat there and no matter what they heard about what happened there, they never did anything. They had these beautiful, as my father used to say, per, beautiful pensionable jobs, you know, permanent pensionable jobs, and they couldn't even do their job. And, and you know, people need to remember, and your, your audience I'm sure remembers this very well, two women died there. Samika Shaw died in 2000 and Karnamaya Monger died. These women died, and no one from Harrisburg thought it was worth their while finding out how these women died, why these women died at that clinic. And these are the very kinds of women that progressive Pennsylvania says they care about. Karnamaya Monger was a refugee who had spent 20 years in a refugee camp only to get to America and die four months later because of Kermit Gosnell. And Samika Shaw was a young African-American mother. You know, and we don't hear much about Samika Shaw. You know, we don't. Why? Why do people not talk more about her? Black lives do matter. Her life mattered. Uh, it, apparently, not to anyone in Harrisburg, though. Yeah, I mean, we first, or uh, especially, heard about Samika Shaw, even though her story has not really that well well been told, when her cousin, a state representative, took to the floor during the uh, legislative debate over uh, abortion clinic regulations. And her cousin, the only uh, member of the Democratic or the uh, the the uh, House Democratic Black Caucus, the only one to vote for the the legislation to uh, to uh, regulate abortion clinics, she stood up and she talked about her cousin dying of sepsis, of the the injuries that she sustained at the Gosnell Clinic, uh, a very moving uh, testimony that she told as she voted for that legislation, and yet in the next election, Planned Parenthood sought to have that legislator, the cousin of Samika Shah, who was killed at the hands of, of Gosnell, uh, they, the Planned Parenthood sought to have her ousted from her office in, the, in that election because she dared to vote for a piece of legislation oh, wow. just to simply stop people like Gosnell from doing his, his, uh, his business. Wow. It, it's incredible. So, so um, as you, uh, you got to see these, these uh, or read that transcript and and come to grips with it. I, I mentioned the the speech that you gave at the Pennsylvania uh, Leadership Council. I mean, it was so clear how this had emotionally impacted you and moved you because of what you saw there. I I know I've been involved in the pro life movement for decades now, and and one of the things that we said uh, used to say in the pro life movement, especially, is if wombs had windows, abortion would stop. And yet we found out with ultrasound and other things that didn't quite happen, that people still were willing to take the lives of unborn children. Now we have people now saying, shout your abortion. You as someone, I remember when you were speaking at the PLC, you said, as you just said here, you and your husband really didn't 
look to do abortion issues and was not something you were kind of would describe yourself as modestly pro-choice or whatever. Yes. What impact did this have as you read that transcript, as you saw these photos, as you understand what happened there at the Gosnell Clinic? Um, and I, it's in the forward of the book, actually. I mean, I think um, I think that there's so many things about this story that 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 were just awful and life altering in a way. Baby boy A, so there were eventually Gosnell, as, as you guys know, as Gosnell went to prison for the, for, particularly for the three. Um, he, he's serving three life sentences for three individual babies that he, that were born, that they could identify that were born alive um, and that they, that they had enough, enough evidence on to get him on. And one of them was baby boy A, who was born, and it's, you know, it's really odd, born on the 12th of July. His birthday was the 12th of July, same birthday as my father. Um, born on the 12th of July, died on the 12th of July. Um, but he had a huge impact on a lot of people. Um, Adrian Moten took a photograph of him. Um, there were, you know, so those photographs eventually put, put Gosnell in prison forever. And that child was born alive and people saw him. Ma you know, lots of people who were working in the clinic and he remained alive. He was put into a, into a Tupperware container. And the details of that, about how he curled himself up um, and when they had the expert witnesses who knew about babies like that, about premature babies, what, how they feel, what, what, what they're like, what they feel like. You know, they give this very powerful evidence that a child at that age would be very cold and that the light, that the bright light would be very hard on them. And when you heard the details of how he struggled to live that baby, baby boy A, you know, there was no denying his humanity. There's just no, de there's no denying the humanity of any of the children. Um, and I think that's possibly one of the big achievements of Planned Parenthood is that they managed to somehow uh, dehumanize these children. And I think it's one of the bizarre gifts of this Gosnell case that there is no doubting the humanity of the children that were that were born alive there. I mean, and and there's one of this. I was just rereading the grand jury before we did this today, and I mean, it's so well written and so powerful. But that was that line they have because on Sundays, Gosnell had his wife work with him for what they called the difficult babies. And these were basically very, very um, advanced children who he didn't even want the other staff to know about. So you could go to his clinic at any stage, at basically any stage. And there's a, there's a, a report that there was one child who was basically due to be born within days and, and that child was killed by, by Gosnell. Um, and they, the, the grand jury say we will, and I remember reading this at the time and I used to always tear up just, we will never know. That's what they said. We will never know because Gosnell took those files away. He disposed of those bodies himself. So those Sunday babies, the, the, the grand jury said, we, will never, we may never know exactly how many, and they will never know how many children were killed there. I mean, there's no doubt to me that he is the biggest serial killer ever in America. And the only reason he's not getting that title is because of people who don't think that these babies are, are human. Um, but I certainly do. I certainly have no doubt about it. And after talking to people like Adrian Moten, you know, who, I mean, her whole story, I think, is extraordinary. And she was there um, when baby boy A was, was born. And she kept that photograph. And Jim Wood, you know, eventually the cops caught up with her. Eventually, you know, they, they found her and they came to her house. And she said, I have something for you. And she had, it was an old phone at that stage. And she, you know, went in the back and got the phone and she handed them the phone. And, you know, they had to send that phone actually to Quantico to get to, re to retrieve the photograph of baby boy. A. And I, you know what she said when she gave them the phone? She said, now I'm free. Finally, I'm free. Um, and I remember saying to her, you know, what was it like? Because she got arrested. She, you know, she went to prison along with the others. And I said, what was it like to get arrested? And she said, um, I, I wasn't arrested. I was rescued. Oh. How she described it. Um, it's an extraordinary story. It's, it's, it, and, and, and page after page in the grand jury, these people in the grand jury, just amazing group of people. Yeah. These were ordinary people, you know, with their knitting. And I mean, even the physical kind of, I mean, you know, we heard from the, from the lawyers, like they, they, people came with their knitting and they came with their shopping and they were, you know, living their lives. But for a year, they had to go in and listen to this stuff. And I always remember one of the things, and I always tell audiences this, because I always feel like people need some hope, you know, they had that one story. I mean, you know that, right? The, the story of the one, I, I, I call it the one that got away. You know that story where they had a witness who came in um, to the grand jury and was being questioned by, um, I think by maybe by, yeah, by, by Christine Wexler. And uh, 
you know, I was pregnant. I went to Gosnell and and she was very pregnant, this woman. And she um, and Gosnell, she she had this, you know, kind of moment where she said to Gosnell, she said, what happens to the babies afterwards? And he said, we burned them. And then she, and it was one of those three day abortions, because these uh, like the later abortions took three days. He would fill the person up with Cytotec. They'd go home. They'd come back the next day. Or, or, the, or he would put in the, the, the dilators. And she came back, she, she went home after the first day with Gosnell and she told her cousin about it. And, uh, and then Christine Wexler said to her, what happened then? And she said, uh, oh, you know, and the, the, so the cousin phoned Gosnell and Va Gosnell said, you're not getting your money back. Um, and, and then Christine Wexler said to her, what happened? And she said, oh, my baby started kindergarten today. And the grand jury stood up and applauded and that in anyone's memory of all of the legal people that we spoke to, no one had a memory of that ever having happened. And I think the reason was that the, the grand jury had, had, had heard so much of the most awful things that anyone could ever, ever hear, that they just were so, it was such a relief and it's such a beautiful thing. And obviously in the film, we make a lot of that because that's the story that we feature at the end because a babe, that baby survived, that baby lived. You know, uh... So many yeah, and I guess if you could share more of just reliving that kind of, I mean, it was five weeks of testimony and, you know, you talk about really that one story of hope, but there was so much that was so grotesque and, and reliving this. Um, I know the police officers that were there often commented about how Gosnell was and how he was almost cheerful, laughing, pointing at people like it just was like everyday business. Uh, what was your reaction to that? And what, what was the talk even amongst you know, I've heard from the, the juror members afterwards that were perplexed with just how he presented himself over those five weeks. Yeah, so I wasn't in the court. My husband was in the court for about a week, um, but I've met Gosnell and and then from everyone I know and from everyone that I've spoken to, and even, and as you say, the jury members in the court um, who, we, who we've interviewed, his demeanor is very, um, is very disturbing. I don't know if you guys have met him, but he has an incredibly disturbing demeanor and whether or not that's, because of, you know, that he lost all of his humanity because of what he was doing, or maybe he never had it in the first place. I mean, it's a really very, very chilling um, to meet him. He has, he has absolutely no affect. There is no, he has no remorse. He has, he's delighted, delighted with himself um, and very kind of cheery, you know, but I think, you know, the jury, we, in, we interviewed very many members of the jury and they were, I mean, everything, everything shocked them. And I think the photographs had an awful effect on them. Um, you know, they had, they, they saw these photographs and the photographs, if you, if you remember, were, so the 47 bodies that were taken out of the clinic were taken to the ME's office and they were in all kinds of states. They had been, some of them were mummified. Um, they were taken out of freezers. They were taken out of these jars. He used to take like um, the top of a, of a, of a milk carton and, and they would, Put remains in there and there were, there were remains everywhere all over the place in, uh, in fridges and freezers um, and in the basement and so the, the Emmy it was his job actually to you know to present them you know um, so that so that medical experts could could make some judgments and and those photographs were taken at very 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 high definition and they're really extraordinary I mean there's one of them where a child has a finger up like that almost in admonition I mean it, they're really really extraordinary so I think it was in, I think it was awful for the jury to have to day after day after day have to be confronted with this, but also confronted by the by the witnesses. I know that like there was a moment where um, uh, Karima Cross was asked because I think Karima so Karima Cross was there when da baby boy A died, and she was asked to stand up and show the jury what the baby had done that he had curled up, and she did that. Um, and that was chilling for them. But I think one of the most chilling moments for the jury was where, you know, because uh, for the, you know, for the for, for this case to proceed, it was very important that the jury understood, apparently, you know, understood the difference between murder and legal abortion. And so that was that was very important that that point was made. It's very interesting what the jury actually came out with when they when they found out all of this. So they had good abortion doctors come, you know, legal abortion doctors come and explain how a good abortion is done when an abortion is done well. And I know from the jury, jury members I spoke to, that was the thing that upset them the most. They were more upset by what was legal than what Gosnell had done in murder. They were more upset because they thought, you're actually allowed to do this. Um, 
And as okay. you probably know, one of the one of those good abortion doctors was asked by way of, you know, explaining it. And when you when you have an expert witness, you always ask them the question, you know, well, why are you an expert witness? Are you really qualified to be an expert witness? And they asked one of those expert witnesses, well, like how many abortions have you done in your career? And you know that we you would change this in the movie. The answer was 40,000. And we changed it to 30,000 because we thought people watching the movie that it would interrupt that they would think there's no way that's possible. We actually changed, we, we toned it down. And the answer was 40,000 and, and the jury gasped at that. When they realized the industrial scale of this thing, when they realized that, you know, that just how prolific, you know, if you like, these uh, abortion doctors are. And that abortion doctor went on to explain how you do a second trimester abortion and third trimester abortions. Um, and, you know, and basically the point was, you know, there's very little difference. There's very little difference between that, which is legal, and what Gosnell did. Very little. It seemed, you know, it's. Uh, I remember um, someone someone commenting and saying it's just a matter of geography, but that from a moral moral point of view, the idea that there's a difference is ludicrous. So they got an incredible education, and it's an interesting point about the jury, by the way, that they were chosen very carefully chosen that they wouldn't be pro-life, that they wouldn't be, you know, anti-abortion, because that might influence them. But I can tell you one thing that an enormous number of them had totally changed their opinion on abortion by the time the trial was over. You're uh, watching a webinar, a live at lunch webinar with the Pennsylvania Family Institute. Uh, we're glad to host this uh, special uh, 10 year anniversary look at the grand jury report uh, from the city of Philadelphia, from the district attorney of Philadelphia on the Kermit Gosnell uh, House of Horrors abortion uh, scandal. And our guests are uh, our director of communications, Dan Bart Koyak and man, uh, Anne McElhaney, uh, the author of, uh, co-author of the book Gosnell and a producer of, and writer of the movie of the same name, the uh, feature length movie with her husband, uh, Philem McAleer. Dan, I wanted to, to, uh, to ask you a question. Dan Barkoyak, our director of communications, has an article published today in the Federalist uh, uh, website uh, that you can access about this 10 year anniversary as well. Dan has followed the story from the very start and worked uh, in communicating uh, about this issue as well as working uh, with the legislature as we did at Pennsylvania Family Institute and other groups to get positive legislation out of what happened in, in this scandal. Dan, uh, one thing that just struck me uh, as Ann was talking there was uh, the sort of prolific uh, assembly line sort of method that the abortion clinics use when uh, this doctor who testified at the, at the, uh, at the trial talking about 40,000 uh, you and I were talking uh, before we came on the webinar here about uh, Delaware, uh, what happened uh, in Delaware at Planned Parenthood in Delaware, similar kind of scandalous uh, activity there. You used a, a phrase, I think, that that uh, that came out about what happened in Delaware. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's many try to think that Gosnell was just an outlier and, and that it's the only one, and, and it's just not true. And, and even just, that's one example. It's shown in the documentary 3801 Lancaster is, is interviewing the former nurses at the Delaware Planned Parenthood who talk about the meat market style assembly line abortions that they did. And, and a former nurse saying he, she was expected to pull in $10,000 a night on abortions. It wasn't, you know, the care of women. It wasn't how, how they do. It was, hey, how much money do you have? And so just the greed and the bottom line that was shown, I mean, it's disgusting. And, and yet, you know, that's a clinic that is still in operation. You know, we talk about the state officials. You talk about National Abortion Federation that inspected Gosnell a month before the FBI raid and could have said something, could have stopped and, and, and yet did not. And, and so, you know, the, 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 everything that came out of the grand jury report and, and the trial, I mean, I, I can remember that when the, the gasp of the jury members to the 40,000, what's ironic is what was reported to the state that every quarter, any abortion clinic has to report how many abortions they performed. And Gosnell was just over 40,000 from 1989 to 2009 was 40,000 abortions. And those were the only ones he reported. I mean, like the Sunday babies, as you mentioned, Dan, that don't have any records. So, I mean, just we're talking about so many of these women that were harmed by Gosnell that went to him for an abortion and all the lives that are lost through these abortions. So. I know that the state, uh, you know, elected officials, they had a hearing shortly after uh, the Gosnell grand jury report came out. It took over a year of debate. Obviously, the abortion lobby and Planned Parenthood 
screamed, uh, no restrictions, you know, put on abortion clinics. You know, they hadn't been inspected in 17 years. And they said, you know, to treat them like any other surgical facility was burdensome, was dangerous, was unnecessary. And it just is sickening how we can't treat abortion the same as all these other surgical procedures because it's the political football of abortion, as the grand jury said. So eventually through a lot of work and advocacy and even help from people around Pennsylvania, about over a year's time, they passed into law to treat those clinics as ambulatory surgical centers. And you know, a great thing that came out of that, there were five clinics that closed right away and two were forced by the state. Both were owned by Stephen Brigham, the infamous late-term abortionist who's had his license revoked in numerous states because of all the malpractice and infractions that he's had. He would have continued operating had not Pennsylvania lawmakers took action to pass that, that legislation. So we've also had clinics like Hillcrest and Harrisburg that women were saying they wouldn't take their cat there for services. And because of an inspection done by the state, it closed them down. So there are in total about nine abortion clinics have closed since the legislation. And we're talking about ones that were owned by the Stephen Brigham, talking about ones that you wouldn't take your cat there because of the decrepitness of the clinic. So to say that that was unnecessary is just putting politics over the health and safety of women. So it's, it's sad to see in states like Texas with the Supreme Court, you know, saying that it's burdensome to, to, to have ambulatory surgical clinic regulations put on clinics. I mean, we're putting, again, politics over the safety of women. This should be something we should all agree upon is to say these clinics should not have uh, you know, outdated uh, material. They should, they should be inspected regularly. You know, if, if the FBI didn't raid Gosnell, how long would he have continued? And so it just is very concerning that we have those that would say we shouldn't even you know, mandate inspections and, and treat abortion separately from any other surgical facility. So, I, and you know what, just, ahead, just, on the, just on that, just on that point, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you're, just, you're spot on. I mean, and you know, what's really disturbing, I mean, you, you guys know all this stuff, but like the night of the raid, you know, you said the FBI were there, the Philadelphia police were there, the DA's office, but also people from the Department of Health were there, right, on the night of the raid. So they go in there and there are cats walking around. There is human, rem human remains um, in, in fridges. There is um, feces on the corridors. The toilets are backed up and there are women in all kinds of awful states there. And you know what the people from Harrisburg, the people from the health department said when one of the women was due to have her abortion? They decided that he should go ahead and do it. You know, and these are the same people, by the way, you know, who go into restaurants and say, shut everything down right now. It's not safe here to eat. You might get, you know, you might get an upset stomach, you know, but they were, it was so important. And the only people who objected that night were Jim Wood and the FBI agents and the, D the DEA guy, sorry, Steve, Steve Doherty um, and Jim Wood and the FBI agent whose name, has, um, 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 whose name has gone from me, Jason Huff. Those three, those guys who didn't know anything about medical procedures or whatever, looked around and they had enough common sense to realize this is crazy. This is, this is not hygienic, right? At least that. And they said everything needs to, they, they said everything needs to stop and the health department, Harrisburg, and the, and the people who were there doing that inspection phoned the higher ups. They made phone calls to the hires up and the message came back, don't stop them. That's who you're dealing with. And, and my, yep. you know, my worry is, my worry is that those people still, you know, I know a lot of people were sacked, but that mentality, I, I question whether that mentality has departed from Harrisburg yet. Well, go ahead, Dan, you were gonna say well, something. I, just, I mean, obviously Jim Wood and those officers, they're viewing it through a lens of helping people. Yeah. And we have to say that the Department of Health and State, those you know, officials are not viewing it through that lens because if they knew what was going on there and they were seeing it, they would have shut it down right away. But yet, yeah, there were two, I believe, abortions that happened that day after the raid. Uh, you know, they, they didn't, it, it's the political football of abortion. You can't touch it. And, and, and yet you're allowing this man to continue butchering babies and butchering women. And it's disgusting that that's, being put on a pedestal because of the abortion lobby and Planned Parenthood and others. They don't want anything to touch their sacred cow of abortion and the profits they get from it. 
So it, it took them all through that lens. But yeah, anyone that would step into that clinic would say, this has to be shut down. Yet you have National Abortion Federation that inspected them the month before was in that they watched abortion procedures happen. They watched people, uh, uh, non-medical staff administer anesthesia. You know, she was saying how unsafe this was, yet she did nothing to report the, the evaluator for National Abortion Federation a month before this all happened, the FBI raid that's raiding it, not because of abortion, but because he's selling oxycodone. I mean, it's just as absurd that, you know, so many had the opportunities to stop him and didn't. Yeah, it's an, you know, it's a miracle actually that with Jim, that Jim would, you know, and we, are, you just love Jim forever. Uh, he, he's stuck with me now as a friend for the rest of our lives. But, uh, you know, there were it, just a complete miracle that he was the guy who went in there and just said, this has to stop. And he wouldn't give up. And I love that quote at the very beginning of the book, you know, where uh, Christine Wexler, you know, was asked to, you know, what I asked her what she thought of Jim Wood. And she said, you know, that he's the only one. She said, he's the only one. He was, he was kind of Maya Monger's champion. He was the only one and it was if it wasn't for him and the fact that he was so you know he just he did his job and he did more than his job he just realized that the death of Karnamaya Monger was so wrong that this was a, you know this woman and I always think about her and, 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 it, and it didn't I, I'd been working on the story for a long time and then something struck me there was a detail about about her death that struck me that 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 is just horrible it's just horrible so she you know she obviously she um was Nepali you know she had she was you know, she'd been in a Nepalese um, refugee camp for 20 years and then she came to the US so she didn't speak English. She had very, very few words of English like hello and good morning, whatever. So she, she really wasn't fluent, right? So she goes in there, so she's been in this refugee camp, can you imagine? And then she comes to America and it's beautiful, it's America and all this lovely stuff, right? But then she ends up in this clinic, you know, alone in this clinic and she she must have looked around and I always think she must have looked around and thought, oh, my God, I'm going to die here. And the, the, the you know, the testimony is that the people who were taking care of her, these nurses who weren't nurses and um, that she put up a fuss and they phoned Gosnell, who wasn't there. He was at home and they, he, they phoned and said she's putting up a fuss. And he said, med her up. And they knew what that meant. And, they, and she was she was medicated to death. The poor lady, you know, she basically, that's what killed her in the end. Um, and it's just an awful thought, you know, that she couldn't even, um, that she couldn't escape and that she couldn't even express that. And she must have been so frightened. Um, and to think that somewhere like Pennsylvania, you know, this is not a backwater, this is a, prog you know, progressive Pennsylvania, that, that Harrisburg have really, you know, they really have that innocent, her innocent life on their hands as well as all the other innocents because they didn't do their job. You know, they weren't, you know, in a way it's like justice being blind. They should have been blind to everything except for the health and well-being of the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And that meant born and unborn. And they should have gone in there and just been as ruthless as they would have been in any other place where people are trying to do things and said, this, there is, this is crazy. These people aren't nurses. There's cats walking around here. And look at this. And this guy isn't an even, even an OBGYN, which apparently you're meant to be in order to do abortions. Like none of that, but it was, as you, as you guys have said, you know, it's all politics. It's all the sacred cow of abortion. It's so important. It's so sacred um, that, we, that we'll, we'll overlook anything and everything to allow this butcher to continue this horror. And only for Jim Wood, only for Jim Wood, that one butcher has been taken off the streets. Well, and I do appreciate too, you know, obviously your, your book, in your movie and, and what it did to allow more people to know what happened. And you mentioned about the, the women that have died and, and the met her up. And, and I've, I've listened to some interviews with former patients and, and uh, again, that the documentary 3801 Lancaster talking about, you know, right. guys now saying, stop being a baby. You know, the women yes. that didn't want an abortion and almost holding her down and stop being a baby. And, you know, I guess my question somewhat in your time of, of interviewing some of the patients, some of uh, just those surrounding this, do they feel that justice has been done uh, with the trial of Gosnell and, you know, obviously he is in prison. Uh, do they feel that that was some sense of justice? Uh, is there still, because of what took place with state officials and others, um, I don't know if you, just a little bit more sharing about obviously all these women that have been harmed by Gosnell, um, just oh, yeah. some more perspective from their I mean, I think there is some. I mean, I think there is some sense of justice being done. The fact that he's never going to see the light of day again. I mean, I think that 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 is important. It's very important. 
Um, and many of them, I think, changed their, have definitely changed their mind about abortion. I mean, Adrian Moten is a good example of that. She's, mm -hmm. you know, she has dramatically changed her mind and says, you know, that abortion is wrong. And um, I mean, one of the interesting things I think that's happened with this movie and the, and the book and really because a book and the movie were both kind of marketed as true crime, which they are. Um, you know, this is this is a crime This happened in a courtroom. This was it's like a procedural Jim Wood as a detective who discovered this case. So people have read this book and seen this movie who are not pro-life, a lot of people. And, and one of the most, um, you know, I, I don't know, maybe satisfying is a kind of a word, or certainly it's been very helpful to me, is the number of people who have written who have had abortions and have watched this movie and have um, changed their mind about abortion. People who are very, very pro-choice, who have changed their mind about abortion because they've gotten an education that they uh, they didn't ask for it because they'd just gone to read um, a true crime book. And I don't know if you know the reaction of many people who went to the movie theaters when movie when we had movie theaters and after the movie would end, they would sit in the movie theater um, in complete silence. And we had these really odd reports. I mean, it, uh, you know, you don't know what's going to happen when you put your movie out into the world, you know, how are people going to react? They said people sat in the movie theater in complete silence. Um, and then we're, you know, very different things happened in different places. I mean, I know in one place, a man stood up and said, would anyone like to pray? And people did. I know in one place, a woman left the theater and she went into an elevator. It was a big theater complex and she went down into her car and she, um, she prayed. And then she wrote a long, long t uh, Twitter thread where she, she described basically that, you know, um, that she herself had had an abortion and that um, you know the, the whole thing had been brought back up to her and that she was you know looking for forgiveness so this I think there's so much hurt out there. I mean I've had very weird experiences myself of going and showing this movie in different places including to um, pro-life groups um, where uh, I there's always one person I've, in my experience there's nearly always been one person who has a an unusual reaction to the film and you know that this is something very personal to them. Um, and it's not just women, by the way. And I think this is maybe an interesting point to mention. Um, I showed it to someone one time and uh, uh, to a man and um, he had a very, uh, you know, a very, very dramatic uh, reaction. And he, and he said, um, uh, you know, there are men who drove women to these places and, he, and they drove there and they stayed in the car outside. You know that there are men there are lots of men who will watch this who drove women and he said they'll always remember you know this is now forever in their mind as where as where they really drove the woman to um and i, I you know the, the so it did this story hurts this story of abortion hurts so many people and forever um and it's uh and i, I you know i i just I, I i hope in some ways that it has done something to to um to help people to heal in some ways because um it's a very it's just it's very difficult and i've often been in a situation where i'll tell you one example actually i went i gave a speech down in newport beach and um it, you know there was a lunch and um, there were waiters and waitresses and you know when i finished the event there was a waitress and she said i didn't know what this was about um can i talk to you and I've had this so many times now that I'm, you know, and you nearly, I nearly know the people when they approach me. I can almost see this. I can see the face, you know, of the person who's approaching me. And and um, and I said to this girl, yeah, I totally. I said, and then she, the guy who was in charge of the restaurant of the restaurant playing of this big complex, basically said, you know, you got to go back and clear the tables. And I just said to her, listen, I'll, don't you worry. I said, I'll wait. I'll wait for as long as it takes till you're finished work. And then she came, and you, you know, you know, the stories are, are the same, you know. Um, and she talked about her dreams and that she dreams about the baby and dreams about that the baby is with her grandmother. You know, it's it's everywhere. And also you meet these people. I did a, an event in Oklahoma City and um, and I met um, a woman. I'm not going to mention her name, even though she's out there in the world, but um, a woman, a nurse who had worked in a in a, a late term abortion clinic in Boulder, Colorado. And um, she and I are friends now. So it's, you know, if you think of the number of babies who have died in abortion, and then you double that to the number of parents those children had and the relatives of those people and the friends of those people. This story affects an enormous number of people. It is, it's, it's huge. And I think we should, I, I think sometimes maybe we forget that. I think sometimes we forget that, that, so, you know, I'm, I'm always very conscious of that now when I go and speak to groups 
you walk in and you think there's someone here who's been really hurt by this story, being really hurt by abortion, personally hurt by abortion, and you don't know exactly why, in what, in what way, but you'll be sure in any group of 100 people or 200 people, there's going to be people there. And I'm always kind of, I'm, I'm always hoping that, um, that my words will be somehow helpful to people um, and that, that they could become evangelists themselves for stopping this. Well, even as you said earlier on about the, the, uh, the woman who was involved with uh, Kermit Gosnell, who later said, you know, after her arrest and, and uh, giving her phone over that she was free. And, uh, you know, you have done a tremendous service, you and your husband telling the story and making it widely known so that people can come to, to grips with uh, their past and with the forgiveness that is available through the gospel and through talking to other people. Um, it's, it's been a tremendous, uh, an absolutely tremendous service. And it's also, I'm sure something for you and your husband to have researched it the way you have and talked about it is something that also you carry and probably I would venture have dreams. I mean, we become friends with the detective and other things, but just to know these things, that to know that humanity is capable of this kind of grotesque uh, treatment of other people uh, is something to carry in and, and uh, terribly said. I want to ask you a question. You, know, you mentioned uh, um, we, we, at the outset, we kind of talked about the empty courtroom uh, and the, you know, the, that picture that uh, J.D. Mullane posted in his thing shamed the news media to briefly start yes. telling about the story again. But then as you and your husband writing the book, um, and then wanting to create the movie, you faced opposition. It was like, please don't tell that story. I mean, talk about that. I was just reading an article from uh, back in, I think 2014, that uh, JD Mullane talked to your husband about, you know, trying to get Kickstarter to fund a movie. Yes. And they kicked yeah. you out. Yeah. Talk, talk about the opposition that you faced uh, related to the abortion industry and the so-called reproductive justice people. It was, it was everywhere. It was, it was, um... It was really, really difficult to get the movie made. It was really, really difficult. Every part of it was awful. <laughs> you know, I'll be honest with you. And, it, and, and, and by the way, you know, it's, and it's not even over yet in some ways. I mean, there's still some battles we're still uh, fighting, um, you know, when we were sued and, you know, we've had, it, it, it was very, very tough. This is, you know, I remember somebody saying, because we had done a lot of um, documentaries about environmentalism and very negative about, um, you know, organizations like Greenpeace and that, um, and exposing some of the, the their um, nefarious activities. And I remember some, I remember when we kind of decided to do this, and I, I mentioned it to somebody and they said, God, you think you've had trouble in the past. You have no idea what trouble you're in now. And as you say, even things like, yeah, we did the, we were, did the crowdfunding campaign. We had successfully crowdfunded for Frack Nation, by the way, on Kickstarter. And we'd had a good experience there actually, you know. Um, it's a very, you know, it's a very user-friendly um, portal. And, uh, you know, we, we've set everything up. And, you know, if you're doing a crowdfunding campaign, it has to be very, it has to be all very synchronized, very, very organized in advance. Otherwise you'll fail get a lot of egg in your face. So we were very, very careful in how we did that because we were doing the biggest crowdfunding campaign they'd ever had was going to be the largest amount of money that ever had been asked for. And, you know, we, we submitted all our stuff and, you, and they say they have no curation. And so we submitted everything all very correct, the bank accounts, everything all very much in order. And, and then, you know, 24 hours passed or 48 hours passed and we had planned for it to go live within 48 hours. And, it wasn't going live and then we're writing to them saying what's happening here and then they wrote i mean they wrote we have the the, the letters from them saying um you're going to have to change the language there you know and um, we have standards they had standards that apparently we had breached by telling the truth by saying that this man had murdered babies which is what the grand jury had said the grand jury themselves had said that um you're going to have to change that you know you know, we, we have standards here. We looked at the standards that Kickstarter have and they have no standards. Bad language, you know, very aggressive language in their headlines. They've, uh, one of their campaigns had an, a dead naked body um, in the campaign photo photography. Like, so they have no standards. The only standards they had was that they didn't like what we were doing, which was telling the truth about abortion. Um, so we decided we didn't want to be uh, on any platform that didn't think the truth was a standard that was worth um, defending. So, you know, it, but it was one thing, it was one thing after another, you know, then we had a thing when we were casting the film and looking for actors, I remember 
you know, we'd get an actor and they'd be like, yeah, great, you know. And then, you know, five days would pass and then they'd write and they'd say, oh, I forgot I'm on holidays then. I'm on vacation then. You know, I forgot I'm doing this then. And that kind of stuff happened. And it was, you know, and even when the movie got into theaters, by the way, I mean, we got reports from all over the country where our name, the name of the movie was not put up on the marquee, where people would go to a cinema and then the cinema would say, oh, we're not playing that anymore. And where people were persuaded we're being persuaded by box at the box office by 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 the people selling the tickets. You don't want to go and see that. You'd prefer to go to see this. It, it was it was constant. I can't even like the list is too long almost. And I um, but it was it was it was very tough. There was amazing opposition. And you mentioned you know the effect of, on us of doing this story and 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 I know you've read the book and I have to say the Holocaust always came to mind when I thought about that. When I thought about everything to do with this, that it was it was like the Holocaust, and those images from from Auschwitz. I mean, that's what that's what it was like. That's what that's what this story was like. And the evil is so profound, and um, and I do believe in the forces of darkness. I do believe in that. And we we were we were surrounded by that a lot of times. And all of the people, by the way, the cops involved. They felt that very strongly, and the and the also the um, the lawyers. You know that the uh, Joanne Pescatori and Christine Wexler they used to go in to um, 30, 30, 3801 Lancaster. You know they had to go in there, you know, to look for evidence and for you know to see things so that they could present that when they were at trial. And you know, I remember I think it was Joanne Pescatori. She said that she that the clothes she wore, whatever she wore in there, she would she would never wear it again. She threw out the clothes because she felt. She just felt that, you know, she was in the presence of such evil. And I think it was Christine Wexler who said she felt the she felt hands on her when she was in there, you know, because you can imagine. I mean, that was the that was the it was like the burial site, really, you know, for for thousands of, of people that we will never, ever know. So terribly sad, so terribly sad, you know, um, as you were talking about the, the the people that you encountered at movie showings and things, those who had been impacted in some way or another by abortion. I was thinking as you were talking about that, I've, I've seen in the chat box the names of some some women, some people who lead a ministries, uh, pregnancy, pregnancy care centers that uh, serve sort of a dual uh, function and more than dual, but helping uh, those who are in challenging pregnancies to uh, to choose life and to uh, avoid the 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 legacy of, of abortion in their life that will, will haunt them in the future, but then also post-abortion counseling and the, the encounters that you had with people who have that haunting them and uh, needing forgiveness, needing, uh, needing help through all of that. And I just want to salute Pregnancy Care Center Ministries and to thank them for their work uh, and to encourage people who are watching this, if you want to think about ways that you can address the issue of, of abortion that is one place to engage and one great place to engage is to support your local pregnancy care center and to be engaged with them and in, in doing counseling and, and providing financial support, et cetera. What has been your in, uh, experience uh, since uh, you, you said yourself, you were not really involved in pro-life work or paid much attention to the issue since producing this movie, writing the book and things, what has been your experience in terms of encountering uh, pro-life ministries, organizations, and things, and what advice might you give to us and others who were in, engaged in this work? Um, I mean, one thing, I said, one thing that I do say when I speak to, um, to pro-life groups is, um, it's kind of interesting that sometimes maybe you presume that the choir know everything. You know, that you think, oh, well, I'm preaching to the choir here, and I'm always surprised by what people don't know. Um, pro-life people even, you know, people who you think would know everything. So I think always remember to um, to go through the basics in a way. Um, I think one thing that I've always suggested um, would be a great idea would be a billboard campaign, by the way, across America, just in letting people know what the law is in the state that they live in, because people don't know. People don't know. So for example, in states where you can have abortion up to 40, up to 40 weeks, that you can have an abortion up to the end of your pregnancy, people should have a billboard up and it shouldn't say anything. It shouldn't say anything at all. It should just say what the law is. Here in California, you can have an abortion up to nine months. Here in Kansas, you can have an abortion up to nine months. Here in Colorado, they should put that up just with the statute number underneath it. Because uh, I've been very surprised. I've had I've had arguments with people who who don't you know. I know that in in Pennsylvania the the law was twenty four weeks, 
I think it's back to 20 now. Is that right? What, what is it now? If, if we didn't have a pro-abortion governor that is a former escort at Planned Parenthood, it would be 20 weeks. But the legislature, after passing it, he vetoed it, saying that, you know, even babies that mostly survive have been born at 23 weeks, 24 weeks, you know, the advancements in science, we can't have that in Pennsylvania. So it is disgusting. And I've, I've certainly talked with people here in our state, even for a limit of 24, but they're like, it's that long? Six months, months in pregnancy? And, it's very and that's, the, that's the other thing that's important, I think, to say. I, and it was very interesting because I, I, that was something that came up with the, the investigators in the Gosnell case. They were like, 24 weeks. And they're like, that's six months. Because when you say six months, I think it's much more powerful than 24 weeks because people don't immediately. That's six, people know what a six month pregnant woman looks like. People know what that's like. Mm. Um, you know, and if you think that there are people, and it's interesting that so many progressives are in favor of abortion, the same very same people who read Dickens to their unborn babies. And it's like, really, why are you reading Great Expectations to a, why would you do that if this is not a person? And I actually think it's a great idea to read Great Expectations to your unborn baby, by the way. But, but it's interesting that you could do that, but also think it was okay that that baby could also be, could be also killed, you know? Um, so I think one of the things, is I, I think that detail of the fact that the law in America is can only be compared to like Pakistan, China, um, obviously Canada though, Canada is in there as well. But you know, you're really in an awful club. The Europeans, you know, for all of their progress, the Europeans don't have any abortion laws like the abortion laws here. I think things like I would I, I think people really get a shock when they know that. And I feel like that's, sort of, that's the sort of stuff that Planned Parenthood really don't want you uh, to talk about. And I think sex selection is extraordinary and happens. And obviously I'd love and I applaud the development. Was it in South Dakota or North Dakota just this last week? Is it about the Down syndrome that, the, that, they've, that they've outlawed selecting um, Down syndrome children, you know, um, to, to, for abortion. I just thought that was, I thought that was, um, that was great. One thing I would recommend people, by the way, I really appreciate you mentioning the 3801 Lancaster documentary. It's wonderful. It's brilliant. And people should watch it and send it around to other people. The other thing that I think is a great thing for people to watch, and I won't, I'm trying to think if I can remember the name of it. You guys maybe know. There's a BBC documentary um, about um, the Down syndrome, the abortion of Down syndrome children mm -hmm. with the actress, from, from, from Bridget Jones's diary. The actress from Bridget Jones's diary, she does, a, she does a brilliant documentary about Down syndrome, a world without Down syndrome. It's free on YouTube. I cannot recommend it more. It's the best documentary I have ever seen. And she is a mother of a Down syndrome person. And she basically found out what, what they're doing in Iceland where they have cured as you know, they have cured Down syndrome. So, you know, do you understand what that means? I mean, anyone who's listening, I mean, they have cured Down syndrome. In other words, every last woman who is, who is told she has a Down syndrome child is aborting that child. And, and this, it's, anyway, the documentary is really, really powerful. I would recommend people watch that, that pro-life groups watch that. Tell people the details, remind people of the details remind people of how abortion is done. I think one of the things that struck me, things that stay with me and that I think are really extraordinary is, because I have all the photographs from discovery from the, from the trial. So, photo, you know, so photographs inside the clinic and I remember seeing things and I'm looking at details and I'm asking people. And as I said, I'm friends now with this woman who used to work in Boulder in um, Hearn's late term abortion clinic. So I would ask her, what's that for? You know, and there was a sieve, like a sieve that you would use for flour for making bread and i'm and I, I said to her what's that for and she said well you have to sieve everything in the suction abortion you have to put everything into the sieve because someone has to put the baby together to make sure you got all the bits people i mean you know and, and what bits like what bits if this is just a blob of cells what bits are you talking about and those bits are hands and legs that's what those bits are and someone does that. And the person who does that is very often not a nurse, by the way. And that's somebody like an orderly or whatever, or somebody like, a, you know, a, a person who's like a functionary inside one of these clinics. And imagine the person that does that. Now, how hurt, what kind of hurt person is that that has to do that? That's what you do for, that's what you do for your job. Um, it's, it's, it's just extraordinary and frightening. I mean, you know, there's so many stories in the Gosnell. I mean, one of the worst stories in the Gosnell thing was, do you remember the one where they, 
um, where the cousins brought their brought their cousin to have an abortion, and they the other cousins went to the pizza pizza place across the road. Do you remember that story? And and then they tried to go back to pick up their cousin, and Gosnell wouldn't let them in. And they, oh God, it's just an awful story. And and they, and they kept he Gosnell kept saying go back and go away and come back again. And eventually they got really annoyed and worried. So they said, we're going to phone the cops if you don't let us in. And he let them in and their cousin was lying on one of the lazy boys, but he had these lazy boys chairs with pe and the woman was naked from the waist down and was in a terrible state. And, and Gosnell said, you probably better bring her to the hospital. And then they were taking her to the, you know, taking her out of the clinic and Gosnell came with a bucket and said, you're going to need to bring them this so that they could go through the bucket and work out what he had managed to extract and what he had left behind. Um, and imagine those people, those young, they were young people and they have that extraordinary, horrific memory in their minds. It's, it's everywhere. Well, and as you, as you tell these stories, you know, when, when uh, our staff was talking about having you on, on this uh, webinar last week and, and I remembered, well, both from reading your book, seeing the movie, uh, hearing you speak in a number of different settings, what a great storyteller you are. But part of that is because uh, rather than talking about statistics, you're bringing to life the real people that are injured by this abortion industry. Uh, that's something, even as we think about the millions, uh, 60 million uh, unborn children whose lives have been taken since Roe in America and many, many millions more worldwide everyone is a human being, everyone is a person and the parents of the, that child uh, yes. impacted by this. And as you tell the stories, go ahead. Yeah, actually on that point, I always make this point and I use, sometimes when I do, when I make speeches, I have this picture. Do you remember, um, do you remember the movie Schindler's List? Hmm. And, and this millions thing, the millions thing is a problem for, for pro-lifers actually. It's a problem because millions are very, no one can get millions in their head. It's a hard, I don't know what millions lo looks like, right? But you know what one looks like and you can care about one child, but millions is very hard to, to gather, to, to grasp. And, and, and Steven Spielberg was very, very smart when he did Schindler's List because he knew that problem. And he knew how important it was to make people feel the humanity of the millions and he, and his clever way of doing that in the film was that he had and you'll remember this do you remember there was a kind of a sepia tinted look to the film it was kind of black and white kind of whatever and there's one piece of color in the film one and it's a woman walking along a street somewhere in germany and she has and she has a little person a little girl you know in a little red coat you know a little like a three-year-old with this little beautiful little red coat you know and you see that and it's a flash at some stage and then at the near the end of the film, when they when they um, when they go into the camps and they see the huge huge mound of dead bodies, they see you see in the mound of dead bodies the red coat, and you realize she's one of them, and it and it and I and I just, I always think that that I've always used that in my head as a thing where I that's exactly right, and it's like baby boy A you can really mourn for baby boy A and he is a symbol for all of the other children that have died. Um, and he's, I, I always love to think that um, the people live very long, you know, you can live a really long life, you know, you could be very, very, and you could never maybe have as consequential a life as the life of baby boy A in terms of how much you could change the world. And I do believe that he um, has that effect on people and will have, and will continue to have, even though he lived a very short life. I will say on that, I, I do want to mention, and I mean, I, I very much appreciate your courage and what you've done with your book in the movie. Um, Thank you. What you've said, you know, all the uh, roadblocks and everything that was put in your way and obviously dealing with this issue. Um, you, know, you brought up the Sally Phillips and the, the documentary for Down syndrome. I mean, the ability to, to humanize what's going on and what you've been able to do and help is be able to humanize what happened in Philadelphia and to show the death of Samika Shaw and then Karaman of Mangar and, and these women that were, uh, live with this now for the rest of their life, being able to humanize this, to show that they weren't alone, that there were all of these other women and, and being able to, to communicate that with them and connect with them and help them heal. I, it just is such a tremendous blessing, all the work that you and Phelan and, and your team have put together to be able to have that impact. So, so we do thank you for that. And, 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 you know, all the speaking out that you're doing, uh, it's, it's an incredible story and I'm, very grateful for it. 
And we're very grateful. I mean, it's a very odd thing to say, but um, I'm very privileged that I got to be the person who got to do this work and to, and to tell this story. I feel very, very privileged and especially privileged, by the way. And I was just saying this to somebody yesterday that um, the film, the story, the whole story has changed, changed all of our lives. Uh, I can tell you among this team, people here got sick. We people puked you know, reading this stuff, going through this evidence um, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of tears. But one of the really great things is the beautiful, amazing people I have met that have made my life so much better. People like you guys, people like, like Jim Wood, by the way, you know, people in those pregnancy centers across America, I've spoken to a lot of them. And these are just, I'm better for all those people. <laughs> these are like the best people ever, you know? Um, and I'm super grateful for that. So that in the midst of all the darkness, you know, there was Jim Wood and there, uh, there is you, you know? So, um, you know, keep on keeping on because um, it's so important. Well, and I want to give, uh, uh, we feel the same way about you. I, I echoed the words that uh, Dan said there as well. And I just want to, uh, uh, to give you an opportunity first to tell people how do they get a copy of your book or see the movie? Is the movie still available for people to view somewhere? This is uh, just a little screen share from, yes. uh, from the website, Gaz, uh, gosnellmovie.com, I believe it is. And yes, and I think, um, it's, I'm not sure where it's available right now, but I'll get someone to send you a link to where you can get it. There's very few places where it's streaming right now. Eventually, hopefully it'll be on Netflix. Um, the book is still available everywhere. Um, and there's an audible version of the book, which um, I narrated myself. Actually, if you want to hear a very funny, a quick story on that, yeah. not funny, but a kind of nice story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, profession we professionally recorded that, you know, with, with a, you know, very, very correct and all of that here. And actually a very nice donor gave us the money to pay for that. And, um, and the first day I went to do the first day of the reading, um, the woman said, oh, it's a great book. And I thought, I looked at her and I thought, yeah, you haven't read it. <laughs> because most people say it's a great book. I puked. Um, it's a great book. I cried for weeks. I couldn't read it all at the one time, whatever. You, you just don't say it's a great book. And so she said, uh, so, so anyway, I thought, fine, you know. So I went in and, you know, you wear headphones and you're in this kind of telephone booth. And, you know, and I, I read and I read and I read. And then I, I said to her, you know, I'm going to stop and step out for a moment and get a glass of water. And uh, I came out and she was weeping. And uh, I was there for a week. And, you know, about three days in, she said, I want you to know I'm very pro-abortion, you know, I'm very pro-choice. And I said, OK, OK. And uh, and I just thought, you know, she was condemned that week to have to listen to the book. And uh, about four days in, she said she had started taking pieces of what I was recording and playing it to friends of hers who were also pro-abortion. And by the end of the week, she said it was the most consequential work she'd ever done and that she had changed her mind about abortion. And I remember I went back to the donor and I said, this is what I did with your money. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he was happy enough <laughs> with how that had worked out. So, um, and I know, uh, you know, so I, was, I was very happy about that. Anyone who hears this story is not the same afterwards. That's right. Well, Dan, if you want to, uh, to mention the, the documentary that you've talked about before as well and how people can get that, I'll put that, uh, that on the screen as well. Is that both you yes, and Andy? Certainly. If you're interested, it, it interviews Gaznell himself, uh, former patients, investigators that were involved in the raid, is 3801lancaster.com. Uh, it's on Amazon Prime. It's on uh, YouTube. You can find a lot of those links at 3801lancaster.com. That was a documentary that we at Pennsylvania Family Institute were uh, grateful to see happen. It was told by uh, storytellers right here, uh, filmmakers right here in Pennsylvania and a uh, uh, project that we were glad to see happen. It started, uh, the, the filmmakers actually came to Harrisburg the day that the first uh, Senate hearing took place with uh, some of the uh, assistant district attorneys in Philadelphia uh, coming who worked on that grand jury report. Uh, it was an amazing day to watch them, just the passion with which they talked about what they had witnessed in that place. So that is a great resource as well. So um, we're, oh, one other thing I'll just mention, I'll put this, I don't need to put the screen up, but uh, we put in the chat box uh, and you can also go to pafamily.org. Uh, Dan's, uh, uh, Dan Barkoyak's article that's in the Federalist today talking about this 10 year anniversary, we recommend that you uh, all take an opportunity to go and look at that as well. Uh, 
I want to thank everyone for joining us on this live at lunch webinar, especially our special guests, uh, our Director of Communication, Dan Barkoyak, and Anne McElhenney. Uh, we are just grateful to you for uh, the way the Lord has used you and are in uh, making a difference on this issue and uh, um, just enduring what you had to endure to, uh, to enlighten people uh, through all of this. It's been a blessing. And as you talked about the lives changed, even with that woman, as you read the book, uh, knowing that this has been used for good. And uh, that, that's uh, uh, just a wonderful testimony. We're grateful for it as well. So with that, I'm going to sign off. I'll put these uh, links on the screen. And uh, we also have put in the chat box, for those of you who are still on there, uh, the link to the A World Without Down Syndrome and the 3801 uh, link as well. All of those are there as well. So any parting words, Anne, at all that you might have? I think I've probably said it all. I <laughs> said it all at this stage. I'm very grateful um, for the opportunity. It's, it's can you believe it? Ten years ago, ten years ago, this grand jury report came out. It's an amazing. Uh, these were amazing people. These were great people. The grand jury people. They did a, They did a, an awful job, and they did it very, very well. Um, and because of them, you know, we were able to. This this came to court, and and Gosnell is sitting in her. In where is he? Where is he in? Where is he now? What's the place called? I'm trying to think of the name of where he is. I've been that in that prison, but um, and he's not getting out. Thank God. But um. Hoping, hoping the story continues to do lots of good. Thank you so much. God bless everyone. And we will uh, meet you next time on Live at Lunch.